So today we're going to continue in the psalm. Now it's no longer uh, Advent, but uh, I wanted to stay in the psalms. We'll be looking at Psalm 21 through 9. Now this is a psalm offered before the king, before a battle. Right now, this it's written by David. So this was uh, David wrote this, and this would be sung to him as he was going in the battle. And that may seem strange, right? A psalm written by David, a song that is a prayer to the Lord for for David's own benefit. It might be odd, but this really shouldn't be. This isn't that strange, right? As as individuals, we all the time ask people. Uh, to, to pray for us. And we give them what to pray for. You see Paul do this over and over again. He does it at the end of Ephesians in chapter 6. He tells people, this is what I need you to pray for. And so that's really what this song is. It's, 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 it's a song before a battle, but it's a song saying, hey, pray to God for these things. So I want to read it all, and uh, then I want to pray and then, and then really break it down. Um, this is Psalm 21 through 9. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all of your offerings and regard you with favor, your burnt sacrifices. May he grant your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation. In the name of our God, set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all of your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. Oh Lord, save the king, and may he answer us when we call. If you're a note-taker, there are three points. Pray for help, pray for a response, and pray for dependence. Let's pray before we uh, enter into his word. God, we thank you for who you are. Lord, I, I pray that, uh, God, that you can uh, use your word to convict and to bring upon repentance. Uh, Lord, I pray for our church at all three locations that you continue to grow us. And Lord, as we look upon this new year, uh, that we seek to honor you with it. That we can look back and see where we have not been obedient. And Lord, that we will repent and seek you in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first point here is pray for help. Um, now, it was, we just got past Christmas, my son Maddox, he, uh, he's been asking me for a web shooter. He kept saying, Dad, I want a real web shooter. And I was like, buddy, I can't find a real web shooter. That, and he says, he said, the way he described it was, I want a web shooter that when you shoot it, it tangles someone up and they're like, and they can't escape. And he, and he would act it out for me. I'm like, well, buddy, I don't think they make those things. And I remember at night he would sit down and we would, and we would pray uh, before bed like we, like we always do. And, and Maddox prays and he's praying for help for, on my behalf, like, and, but really for himself. He's saying, God, help daddy find a web shooter that ties people up and where they can't escape. <laughs> right? He was asking for help really for his own benefit. Um, I, I find that when we see the Psalms, it's exactly what we see here in the beginning. There's this praying for help, right? So David's, remember, David wrote this in verse 1. It says, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. And may he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. For David, he's asking for prayer before a battle. Right? He's leading thousands of men to their potential deaths. And if he loses, many innocents are going to be slaughtered. This weighed heavy on David. So no, he knows that David, or that God has his hand over all of this. That God is supreme over, and in, in all of these workings, it's why he's asking people to pray to God. He says, remind God of his promises. That you're going to give us help. Now, it's not as if God forgets 
what he promises. Right, we forget the faithfulness of God. This is why throughout scripture, God's past deeds and those things that he's done, that they, they, they are sung and they are prayed for. Right? The, the people of Israel cite and remind themselves that this is the God who brought Moses out of Egypt. Right? They, they have to sing and pray, remind themselves of the God that they serve, not because God is forgotten, because oftentimes we need to be reminded that our Lord is ready to help and provide support. I know that there are many of you who are in need of prayer. Even in our, our small church here in the valley, we've uh, seen people who are who've, who've dealt with a lot of pain uh, this past year, who've experienced heartbreak. So church, I, I pray that this year we can be used by God and empowered by the Holy Spirit so that we can be a help and a support to those who need it. Because like David, though it may be very different, we are in a, in a war. We are in a war and we are battling daily. Ephesians 6, 10-12 tells us, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Either you believe that or you don't. And if you do, we need to be a people who are praying for each other, praying for help, praying that when trouble comes, that we will be faithful and dependent on the one who can offer deliverance. The second point is pray for a response. Verse 3 says, May he remember all of your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant your heart's desire and fulfill all of your plans. Oftentimes, before the war raged, right, people would go and make offerings and make sacrifices. This was not to win over God. right? This wasn't to impress God. It was to show them that they were an obedient people who understood that they are dependent on their Lord for victory. The Old Testament church here is offering what they had for the good of the whole. I love that. It wasn't about being an individual. It wasn't about uh, the amenities that they received, right? They saw a victory of others as a victory for themselves. The victory of others was their victory. Because this was their family, this was, this was their, their people that were on the verge of defeat, on the verge of being slaughtered. What if we approached the spiritual welfare of our, of our church family with that mindset? see this in scripture that when Israel failed their God was mocked right, the question is who is this God who couldn't even protect his people for us the question may sound like this who is this God who can't even be taken seriously by his people and David is asking his people to sing to God the following verses listen May he remember all of your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. Right? There's an assumption here that offerings have been made. There's an assumption that burnt offerings were given. There's a saying that I like. It says, don't ask a man what he believes, but watch him and you'll really see what he believes. When we look to God, praying for help, reminding ourselves that God promises to help and take care of his people. God makes promises that his love will not fail. He promises that he will be near to us when we pray to him to bless those who delight themselves in his word. His promise 
He promises salvation to those who believe in Christ. He promises comfort in trials. He promises that all things will work for, out for our good. He promises a new life in Christ. He promises every spiritual blessing. He promises to finish the work he started. He promised abundant life, rest, and return where we get to spend eternity with him. We tell God of his promises, reminding ourselves what God has promised his people. But what verse 3 reminds us to ask is are we conducting ourselves like we are his people? If you ask God, remember what I've given up because of my love for you. God, look what I've left behind because I want to follow you. God, look at my life and how it's been wrecked by your gospel. What will God see? Will he see a life of sacrifice? Will he see a, a life that's been wrecked at all? Listen, our Lord will not be mocked. Understand, it is mockery to say that we love the Lord, that he is our king and our Messiah, yet we refuse to follow him in what he commands us to do. That is mockery. If it is to share the gospel, then that's what we do. If it is to disciple, then that's what we do. Husbands, if we are to lead our wives loving her like Christ loved the church, then that is what we do. Wives, if it is to submit and respect your husbands, then that's what we do. If it is to raise our kids in the way of the Lord, then that is what we do. If we were to give of our finances then we do it with joy. If we are to outdo each other in love and honor, then we do it because we were raised to life so that our entire being would be dripping with praise of the grace and the mercies of God. This life is to be our spiritual worship. We're to see his help in all that he's done for it. And there should be a response. Not to win his affection. But out of worship and love of this God. When sin comes to head with God's grace, only the dead and damned won't respond in worship through repentance and praise. I love this quote. I'm not a big fan of the, the man who said it. His name is Charles Finney. But I do like the quote. It says, To mock God is to pretend to love and serve Him when we do not. To act in a false manner, to be insincere and hypocritical in our professions, pretending to obey Him, love, serve, and worship Him when we do not. Mocking God grieves the Holy Spirit, and it sears the conscience. And thus the bands of sin become stronger and stronger, and the heart becomes gradually hardened by such a process. So pray, and you must pray, that we continue to battle this year, and that this year will not describe us. Verse 4 of Psalm 20 says, May he grant you your heart's desires and fulfill all of your plans. Now, those singing are thinking of David and Israel in battle. The, the strategies, the plans they had put together to win the day. This is what they have prepared to save God's people, to protect them from death. As the church, the body of Christ, is your heart's desire to contend for the faith of others. To strengthen their faith. To see people profess Jesus for the first time. Is that your heart's desire? To see him glorified and be known in 
your community and by his people. Ask yourself and look at this past year to tell you not what you say you believe, but what you really live out, what you really believe. Is that your heart's desire? This past year, what has been the end game for you? What is it that you've been seeking? Is it God's glory? Have you used what you have to help God's people or further his mission? Verse 5 says, May we shout for joy over your salvation. And in the name of our God, set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all of your petitions. I love this verse. They sing this as they go into battle. After men have been swinging their swords, driving their chariots into their enemies. After people have been giving and sacrificing, as the leaders have been strategizing, who do they give credit for the victory? You see in that second part of verse 5, in the name of our God, set up our banner. And may the Lord fulfill all of your petitions. This recognition that their victory, that their life was spared, all of that was given, all that was sacrificed for the cause, it didn't win the battle. That was a response to who God is. They gave credit to the Lord Himself for answering their prayers, for giving them deliverance. May we as a church and as individuals act in such a way. And may we never boast any victory that we have. For we only have victory in Jesus. And finally, let us this year pray for dependence. Verses 6 and 7 says, Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. We see his salvation is the Lord. It is his and let us never forget that. As we see the Old Testament church, they see that God is faithful and that he saves his people. He saves them from death. He saves them from captivity and from despair. The Lord, mighty and strong, holds his people firm in the might of his right hand. Church, as you pray that this year we will continue to see our ministries, our churches. Pray that all of it will be dependent on Him. We can pray that the Lord blesses our strategies as we charge against the gates of hell. But let us never think for a minute that any success that we might see or have, let us know that it is completely dependent on Him. All that this church does and all that we seek to do, the gospel needs to be at the center and His exaltation needs to be the end. David moves to remind us that we often seek and find comfort, independence, and, and silly things. Verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Right, David points out that some trust in the tools of victory rather than the author of salvation. Now this year, two of our churches... The Valley and Milton are acquiring buildings. And it is a fear and a concern of mine, though, though I'm all about it. I, I'm excited behind me right now. You're looking at where we hope 
have service starting in February. But my fear is that we will start to trust in the tools, in the blessings of the Lord, rather than finding and, and rooting our dependence in Him alone. This building or the building in Milton won't save a soul. It won't make ministry work. It has to be people indwelled by the Holy Spirit, moved by Him, empowered by Him, seeking to do His mission for His glory. That, that is what's going to impact people, the gospel. Pray that we don't trust or put our trust or hope in a facility of any sort. The mark of God's people is found in verse 7. It says, we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Let this be said of New Heights Church. Not just its pastors. Let it not just be written in a mission statement somewhere in our constitution. But you, me, all of us who are the church. Let our faith rest in the Lord. For each of us has been granted faith by grace. It is what we are justified by. And let our faith be our shield so we can extinguish all flaming darts of the evil one as we fight a spiritual battle. Let his word be our sword. And for those who trust in the tools or put their dependence in the blessings of the Lord rather than the Lord himself, listen to verse 8. They collapse The contrast in the second part of eight represents those who put their trust and their faith in God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. Right? We rise and stand not because of the strength of our own legs, but because of the might of the right hand of God which holds us upright. The fallen and the collapsed fail to depend on the mighty hand of God. And those who fail to recognize it, we see they now lay in a puddle of their own pride. Finally, verse 9. David tells his people, O oh Lord, save the king. You have a king in the ancient world, right? Showing that he needs something outside of himself or his men for salvation and victory. Go study ancient kings. You don't see this type of humility. Not by the Caesars. Not by the, the Greeks and Alexander the Great. Oh Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. Listen, a life that is dedicated to a dependency on God is a life that recognizes both his goodness and sovereignty and understands there's no better place to rest. Church, we love you. We're praying for you. We ask for your prayer. We ask that we, all of us, can respond to the gospel in a way that exalts our Lord, that we may live a life worthy of the gospel, so that we may not bring shame upon it. But Lord, I pray, I pray that this new year for our church, that it can be one of many blessings, continued blessings, one where we see God move in a mighty way. That means we're going to be on the front lines. We're going to deal with hard things because the battle isn't easy. But it does require unity. It requires us praying 
and supporting and encouraging one another, responding to the call to reach the lost, responding to the call to disciple, to strengthen one another, but responding to a call to rely and be completely dependent on our mighty God, the King of Kings, I ask that you pray these things for God's glory and your good.